Good morning everyone. Welcome again to the course The History of English Language and Literature. In today's session, we will continue to look at some of the aspects uh, which made Elizabethan theatre very distinct from any kind of theatre that existed in uh, England until that point of time. In the previous session, we also saw how Shakespeare made use of this peculiar phenomenon which had emerged in Elizabethan England. And we ended the previous session uh, looking at how Shakespeare particularly made use of uh, special theatrical effects and special theatrical illusions. So, here we go taking a look at what Elizabethan theatre was and how it was uh, framed. Elizabethan theatre in particular refers to the kind of theatre which uh, existed in uh, England from 1562 to 1642. And this uh, we may also note that this did not, uh, this was not limited to Queen Elizabeth's reign alone, but a particular kind of theatre gets uh, named as Elizabethan theatre even after the uh, death of the Queen. And theatre during Elizabethan times, it was a focal point of uh, all kinds of entertainment. In fact, this, uh, this is uh, seen as the most sophisticated and the most popular form of entertainment that uh, prevailed in England from the Elizabethan times onwards. And also, this is not to say that this had wide acceptance, but at the same time, there were a lot of problems, a lot of uh, uh, dilemma about whether to continue this form of entertainment or not. The church was uh, against it, the Puritans were against it, the London government thought it was not a, a safe kind of entertainment to pursue. However, we see that uh, the Elizabethan drama dominated England during the 16th and even into the 17th century. And uh, there were three different kinds of uh, uh, genres that dominated, mainly comedies, histories and tragedies. We also saw how these uh, distinctions were being made uh, during Shakespeare's times as well. And during this time, it is very important to note that play going was a fairly inexpensive uh, thing to do. So, many of the people they used to gather, they used to crowd near the theatres to watch a play or two. And uh, there was another ironical thing about uh, Elizabethan theatre that made it uh, very special and also of historical importance. Uh, in fact, uh, it was almost like a double edged sword, like uh, it was loved by the Queen and the Privy Council and it was a favourite of the court. We also find many of these uh, uh, playwrights being supported by the court. We find that Shakespeare himself enjoyed a lot of patronage and a lot of support from Queen Elizabeth herself. But at the same time, these playhouses and drama in general was uh, hated to the core by the Puritans and also by the London government because they thought this could be another uh, case of uh, law and order or they also thought that the people crowding at the theatre could uh, uh, make London another breeding uh, ground for uh, diseases. Uh, if you remember, the plagues continued to attack uh, until about early 17th century. And how are these venues getting shaped and reshaped and uh, refined during the Elizabethan times? We find a transition from the street to a building and this is made possible only uh, from the Elizabethan times onwards. If we uh, look at how earlier plays were being staged, we used to see in some of the earlier sessions that the place used to be staged almost anywhere. In, in fact, there was no fixed theatre in England and initially uh, most of the plays were staged in certain temporary acting spaces. We saw in the case of the mystery and the morality plays which were being staged in the church first and then into the town squares and also they were moving uh, wagons which uh, took actors uh, from one location to the other where people used to uh, crowd at, at particular points. So, we also saw how the interludes made uh, its way into uh, the court sphere, into manor houses, into private wealthy audiences so on. So, uh, there is a transition which takes place quite gradually and we almost find this uh, shift becoming, uh, shift completing a, a full cycle during the Elizabethan uh, times. Uh, from the Elizabethan times onwards, we find the idea of a fixed theatre becoming a reality. And most of these theatres were situated in London and even when there were certain laws which uh, uh, kind of curtail the, uh, the, the activities of drama, we find that the theatre does not move much away from the city, but they just stayed somewhere around the city so that uh, it remained accessible to the uh, common people and also in that sense it continued to be the centre of uh, uh, London's uh, uh, amusement and entertainment activities. And uh, there were two kinds of theatres which uh, uh, were getting built once uh, the transition was complete in terms of a physical structure. They were either open to the sky with a central open yard in the uh, centre 
or they were enclosed playhouses as we mostly see in contemporary times. So uh, there were basically three kinds of theatres that existed, uh, inn yards, open air amphitheatres and playhouses. So these are some of the uh, major names that dominated uh, England and particularly London and the surrounding areas and uh, we will uh, be seeing a little uh, more detail about these playhouses in general. And uh, to, to give you some historical facts, the theatre was the first theatre building to be built in England. This was in 1576 by the Earl of Leicester's players and this was led by Germ James Burbage who also happened to be a very famous uh, actor of those times. In fact, uh, he was also a very close uh, uh, friend and acquaintance of uh, William Shakespeare. Shakespeare is uh, said to have begun his acting career with uh, Burbage. And the theatre which was initially named as The Theatre, it was later pulled down and rebuilt as The Globe 15, in 1599 and The Globe as we know, it remains very central to Shakespeare's dramatic career throughout. And if we take a quick look at these different kinds of uh, uh, theatres, they were initially these inn yards as the name suggested, they were built uh, adjacent to the inns or taverns which uh, existed in England. In fact, taverns and inns were quite popular in London during that time and some historians even feel that it was a main reason uh, of uh, uh, law and order discord in London because uh, the taverns where as the name would suggest there was a lot of uh, drinking, there used to happen a lot of fighting. So, it was almost uh, a kind of place where uh, if one could uh, say it like this, all the bad guys in the town got together to spend an evening. So, this was where the uh, in this was how the inn yards look like. The place used to be staged in almost a makeshift kind of an arrangement. And this was uh, an elaborate structure in the sense that it could house about 500 people at the same time. It was affordable for common man. It was uh, not in a formal setting. It was uh, more or less casual which also made it quite endearing to the, the crowd which gathered over there. And these are some of the prominent uh, uh, inn yard spaces, Red Bull, Cross Keys, Bell Savage and the Red Lion. And moving on, this is how the open air amphitheatres were structured. As we can see, it is an elaborate structure. This also has come to represent the most uh, uh, common form of Elizabethan theatre. And the prominent ones were the theatre, the globe and the swan. And this was very elaborate and huge in the sense that it could house about uh, 1500 to 3000 people at the same time. It was built uh, as a three storied structure as we can see in this graphical representation. And this was also about 10 meters in diameter. So, this was uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, it was not always built in the center of the town and uh, in order to escape all kinds of uh, rules and regulations which were being imposed by the London government, it used to be in the outskirts of the city. And this in fact, if we uh, do a quick survey of Elizabethan uh, literature, if we, go at, if we do a quick survey of Elizabethan drama, this perhaps is the most uh, uh, prominent image that would uh, come to our mind. And also the, these, these different parts and different structures of the theatre we would be taking a, a look at in detail shortly. And the globe was perhaps the most uh, famous uh, and it continues to be the most famous and the best known of all Elizabethan uh, theatres. And Shakespeare in fact used to describe this as a wooden O given the structure in which it was built. And this is how the structure of the theatre uh, used to be like. Uh, this is in fact uh, a picture which was uh, projected from the later times. And this uh, the structure was uh, mainly wooden and uh, polygonal and there was an unroofed central yard right at the centre and this was also the place where a uh, set of people known as the groundlings used to sit. We would be uh, taking a look at them shortly. And theatre uh, structure was surrounded by tyres of covered galleries as we can notice over here. There were also uh, seats for different classes of people. According to these uh, seatings, the hierarchy, the payment, everything differed as well. And it is generally said that one could even get a padded seat for an extra payment. And the stage was in fact a very large platform which projected from the tiring house into the yard and this space where the common people are found to be sitting that uh, uh, was considered as the yard and the tiring house was a uh, uh, more, like, more or less like a, a storage house where the actors uh, could uh, get dressed where, where, they, where their costumes were being stored uh, etc. So, this is how the structure looked like and uh, more detail look at the, more, the most prominent uh, theatre of those times, the globe. The purpose of the flag we shall be taking a look at very shortly. These were the different structures 
and in fact most of these representations were also paintings and graphic representations from a later period and as we know there was no way in which one could get a very accurate uh, uh, reproduction or a picture of those times but uh, uh, depending on the many uh, historical conjectures this representation is said to be fairly accurate. And who were the groundlings whom we noticed sitting uh, right in front of the yard in this open structure? Uh, this was in fact uh, a place where the poor audience could sit by just paying a penny. They were uh, generally known as groundlings because of uh, a reference to them in the play uh, Hamlet by Shakespeare. And uh, this was more like a pit in front of the stage. There were no uh, seating arrangements given for them. They had to uh, just stand and watch the play and this also uh, was considered as an unruly kind of a crowd and it was mainly because of them that the London government did not want to encourage uh, the playhouses or the staging of the place uh, much and uh, uh, this uh, the, the groundling uh, the groundling crowd was also a very cheerful lot they used to cheer the hero they used to boo the bad guys so they made the theatre space uh, very lively and sometimes quiet uh, to the uh, discontent of the other upper class uh, viewers as well. And in fact, very often they also could get very restless because they, uh, whenever the profound things were being said or whenever the play continued to be in verse, uh, ruminating in philosophical discussions, they could get very restless. In fact, this is why we see a lot of other things being built into Shakespeare's uh, plays particularly. And we find him including a lot of uh, body and dirty jokes in his play to attract the commoners and to keep them uh, engaged. There are also uh, sword fights and many such engaging things that Shakespeare used to include just for the purpose of uh, catering to the taste of these uh, groundlings. Also recently we may uh, note that a lot of work also being done on the kind of audience they were and the kind of uh, things that they force the playwrights to bring on stage. And the third kind were known as playhouses and they were also uh, private houses and quite expensive and they could house about 500 people at the same time they were also enclosed which made all the uh, uh, much difference to the way in which uh, plays were getting staged then so since these were not uh, open uh, in the center plays could be staged during night and winter as well because the other structure uh, as we saw earlier in terms of globe major playhouses such as globe uh, the open air amphitheater space made it quite inconvenient to stage plays during a bad weather or even when there was no uh, sunlight. So this in that sense was uh, more inclusive but however since it uh, always catered to a private uh, upper class audience it did not have the kind of popularity that uh, Shakespeare's typical amphitheatrical ambience uh, had. Um, and uh, if we try to look at the statistics, there were about 27 playhouses in Elizabethan London and this is uh, a projected map of Elizabethan London from those times. And uh, we can also notice that there is this river Thames which divides the city into two parts. The, uh, the other part of London was also known as uh, uh, Satak and in fact uh, in Satak it is generally noted that uh, London's laws did not uh, apply in Satak much. So in that sense, uh, this uh, uh, the area surrounding Satak was also seen as uh, uh, an area where a lot of taverns existed and there was also gambling, uh, prostitution and certain very cruel games such as uh, bear baiting, cock fighting. So it is also said that Shakespeare did not enjoy bear baiting much. In his plays, we do find him talking against these some um, uh, predominant kinds of uh, amusements which were also inflicting a lot of tr a lot of cruelty on animals. So having said that, uh, these were some of the uh, major playhouses we can begin to see over here, the Globe, the Swan, the Hope, the Rose and uh, we also find that the theatre and the curtain, they were uh, quite outside, uh, quite uh, in the outskirts of the city, uh, the fortune we find over here and also um, most of the playhouses, most of the inn yards that we discussed, we find all of them getting situated in and around the city of London. We also find that uh, they were not really placed in the centre of the city, they were along the river banks or somewhere in the outskirts perhaps to uh, not to run into any problems with the London government. So what were the performances of those times like? And the shows were advertised just like uh, they are in the contemporary. The, uh, the, the way to announce the play was 
through this uh, flag which was projected at the uh, top of the theater. And uh, this was done in such a way that even the ones who reside uh, across the river could see it. A white flag, flag indicated uh, that it is a comedy, a red flag for history place and a black one for tragedy. So, they could see the flag well in advance and decide whether they wanted to watch the play or not. Also, uh, the plays were mostly staged only during daytime and this was uh, primarily due to two major reasons. Even when the playhouses were an enclosed space, there were no provision for lights and candles were pretty expensive during uh, those times. And also, the, the government uh, also did not want the shows to go on later into the night for due to uh, disciplinary reasons and law and order issues. And stage curtains were also not uh, getting used then. And just like you know, if we have if you watched a play in the contemporary, you would know that right at the outset there is a curtain which is uh, uh, being uh, moved. So, here uh, uh, in the Elizabethan times, there was no provision made for stage curtains and there were very few uh, stage props also getting uh, used and also the scene changes were indicated uh, verbally. It was just announced by either a voiceover or by a character who showed up on stage. So, there were no elaborate stage arrangements and uh, instantly costumes were the most expensive things that a theatrical production uh, owned the companies were quite uh, uh, possessive about their costumes, guarding them and guiding them, which is why a separate attiring house or a tiring house was built into almost all theatrical structures. And uh, the costumes were very elaborate, very rich. It said that the people used to come even to just watch those uh, their favorite actors on stage with elaborate costumes. And uh, uh, the stage was also uh, projected in a particular way. Uh, this ensured a closer intimacy between actors and audience and the stage was also called as a thrust stage if you noticed it in the uh, graphics that we had displayed earlier. And uh, this also made much sense for certain uh, uh, scenes of soliloquy which most of the Shakespearean uh, plays had so that it almost felt as if the actor was, uh, directly con uh, was directly conversing with the audience and it made a lot of impact on uh, the uh, dramatic craft as well. And uh, because of this open roof, uh, staging a play had many more challenges than it has in the contemporary because the actors had to deal with many distractions such as the weather, noise, the unruly crowd. There was no way in which all of these things could be managed. In fact, uh, uh, if we compare it to the uh, contemporary times, uh, theatre was not seen as a sacrosanct space. One could uh, make noise over there, one could um, exhibit unruly kind of behaviour. There was no one to manage the crowd. So, the actors had to in many ways brave these very difficult, uh, these very different and difficult situations there. And interestingly, there was no women on stage. So, this could be, uh, this could come as a historical curiosity since most of the plays had very central women characters in place. So, how did they manage them? And uh, most of the times, uh, young adolescent uh, boys were made to play the role of uh, a female on stage. And in fact, bringing a female onto stage in front of so many strange men, it was even illegal in Elizabethan England. So, nobody wanted uh, to go against the law. If you remember in the in the movie which was made out of Shakespeare's uh, life, Shakespeare in Love, there we uh, see that the main character, the main female protagonist um, masking herself even to uh, come for a uh, kind of an audition. So, in fact, it said that even historically during those times, there were few women who used to come and uh, attend these plays and they could not really uh, come freely like the audience and the men and many of them are said to have masked themselves so that nobody would know who they were. So, this was a kind of situation for women during those times. It was uh, they could neither act nor uh, were they free to go and uh, watch the play. So, one could also uh, begin to perhaps understand why there is a very stark absence of women playwrights during Elizabethan England. And this irony becomes all the more uh, significant because the uh, monarch was a female herself. And in spite of that, we do not find that kind of uh, uh, freedom being given to the uh, women of, of that time because uh, many of the things were already institutionalized and it, uh, England had to come a long way because uh, before they could uh, engage with female artists in a public space. And uh, uh, contrary to the many depictions in modern uh, cinema or in the modern stage, 
uh, one could infer that there was perhaps little or no uh, kissing or any scenes of physical intimacy during the Elizabeth in the Elizabethan stage because all of this was considered quite immoral and body and uh, now from Shakespeare's plays and the other plays of the times we can easily imply that love scenes were mostly verbal there was no amount of physicality uh, was possible or could have been tolerated and the, and the theater was always under the scrutiny of the government or of uh, the uh, uh, the puritans so the playwrights and the actors also always took uh, always took much care to ensure that in no way they offended the sensibilities of elizabethan england uh, some of the peculiar features of uh, this uh, Elizabethan uh, theater, it would uh, sound uh, some of the peculiar uh, features of the Elizabethan uh, drama included uh, that the actors were the stakeholders and not the playwright, uh, not the playwrights or, or the ones who own these playhouses. And uh, there is this concept of the box office which has lived into the contemporary as we know. Uh, the spectators had to drop a penny in the box kept in front of the theatre. So, uh, from uh, now we know from where this idea and concept of the box office emerged. So, the set of people, the owners who shared the profit were also known as the housekeepers. We also noted in the previous section that uh, uh, Shakespeare also was one of the shareholders of, a, uh, of the prominent uh, uh, theatres then. So, in Elizabethan times in fact, it was not just the emergence of theatre, we also see the growth of an acting culture. And uh, we can see that it is in Elizabethan England that uh, the birth of acting profession, uh, uh, the birth of acting as a profession takes place. And earlier it was uh, mostly amateur actors, if we go back a little in time and recall the previous uh, lectures, initially it was a clergy who acted and then it uh, as it moved into the initially it was a clergy who came as actors and later on when drama became under the control of the uh, guilds and the uh, townsmen we find uh, a certain amateur men from the craft guilds coming on as actors and uh, it was not a professional kind of activity at all then. But by the end of the 16th century we begin to note a very stark difference in the way acting is being perceived and also a certain professionalization not just of acting but also of art in general begins to happen. So, in the uh, 16th century we find most of these actors being patronized by powerful and uh, wealthy nobles and we also find that they are uh, heavily encouraged and funded by these powerful figures in London. And in fact, with the emergence of theatre companies, we also find that the actors begin to enjoy a lot of uh, protection against the threat of Puritans, uh, against the threat of censorship which uh, was uh, coming from the London government and also threats of closure. This was primarily due to the, uh, the fear of infection of plague. So, the, in, in a certain way we can say that the actors were quite covered because of this patronage, they had a, a steady wage. They also, uh, these patrons also ensured that they could get enough for their livelihood even when uh, the plays were not getting staged on a daily basis. So, but this stability incidentally was only for the actors. So, whatever we had been talking about the emergence of Elizabethan theatre and the prominence of the Elizabethan actors, it, it only implied the actors and not the playwrights. This professionalism and this financial stability and even the protection from the patrons, it was mainly only for the actors and not for the playwrights. In fact, during those times, even successful dramatists could not uh, remain financially secure. There were many who were living uh, in poverty, many who were continuously under the threat of financial insecurity and here also we find that Shakespeare rises much above all of them and significantly he is the only dramatist who enjoyed a similar kind of popularity and a similar kind of financial security and perhaps way above all the actors put together uh, from the Elizabethan times. This brings us again to the initial point that we began with in, uh, in, the, in our discussions about the Elizabethan period, discussions about uh, uh, Shakespeare in general. And as and when we note that Shakespeare's life is an exception to the rule, this brings us back to some of the original comments that we made right at the outset of our discussion on Shakespeare, that he is perhaps the only one who survived into posterity in spite of the age dying out in terms of uh, culture, its uh, literature, its, its lifestyle, so on and so forth. So, with this we come to an end of this lecture. 
and we have noted how Elizabethan theatre developed as a supreme form of art and in the following sections we will also continue to look at the other forms of art and other forms of literature which were uh, predominant in Elizabethan times. We shall also be devoting a little more time to the prose and poetry that developed in the Elizabethan uh, times. So, with this uh, we wind up today's lecture. Thank you for listening and see you in the next class.